This lecture is an introduction to my thoughts, opinions, ideas, as well as a look at my images and books as they relate to appropriation, to authorship, and to dissemination. Currently, I reside in Lawrence, Kansas, where I'm a visiting assistant professor in photo media at the University of Kansas. I received my MFA in 2010 from the University of Kentucky. I'm a photographer of sorts, and I make books. In order to provide for you a loose framework within which to consider my work and my incentives for making it, I will offer you what is for me undoubtedly a work in progress. I will also offer up with this the admission that I am neither a philosopher nor a scientist, and I might, before continuing, remind you of the presence of theory within this title. This theory is merely a series of sequential claims that I hold to be true, or close enough to be true to be taken seriously. They concern three major areas, photographic reproduction, technology, and authorship. First, photographic reproduction is governed by, and as a result limited by, natural boundaries. That is, photographic systems and methods are contingent upon the principles and physical laws of light. Photography is steadfastly bound to these rules, as well as being limited by them. Photographs are simply systematic interpretations of the interaction between light and matter. A most basic illustration of these principles is the camera obscura. Though having an uncertain birth, or at least a widely disputed one, it is believed to have been a phenomenon understood by humans dating as far back as 400 BC. The term camera obscura literally translates to dark room, camera being Latin for room or vaulted chamber, and obscura Latin for dark. This device, effectively a small hole in the side of an empty box, room, house, cave, TP, or airplane hangar, is a simple demonstration of optical principles that allows for photographic reproduction to be possible. Secondly, photographic reproduction is reliant upon technology from its inception throughout the film age and to increasing levels with digital and emerging methods photography as a reproductive medium necessitates a relationship with technology as a mechanical chemical or digital entity reproduction is inseparable from the technology that enables it this also includes camera-less images like those of Anna Atkins, Maholi Naj, and contemporary artists using screen capture or scanners as cameras, or even artists using written code to generate photographic composites. But not only is technology always associated with photographic reproduction, but technology in itself is in a state of constant flux. Photographic technology is constantly changing, and it has been since its inception. Daguerre, Talbot, Atkins, Brady's glass plates, Adams and the Zone System, the Leica, the Brownie, the Polaroid, CMOS and CCD sensors, the late Steve Jobs and his iPhone camera, even those ironic hipsters with their hipstamatic app and obsessive cross-processing. Not only is this technology changing, but these changes in technology lead to changes in the photographs themselves. Within the trajectory of the medium, methods of production have come and gone, and come back again. Each new technology brings with it its own characteristics, object qualities, tonal range, and color palettes. They also each have varying levels of resolution, sharpness, and color accuracy. As the medium continues to evolve with the addition of digital technology and many wandering back to old methods, there remains a strong diversity in the essence of the photographic object. Another aspect of these changes in technology are changes in the relative speed and ease of the photographic process. From a more pragmatic standpoint, different technologies and, method, and methods make reproduction easier or harder, more cost efficient or more expensive, faster or slower. Though not all processes increase speed, it is fair to note that there are a varying level that there are varying levels of speeds of photographing. This results in from changes in technologies. For example, 16 by 20 wet plates offer a different level of time investment than the Kodak Brownie or the iPhone. 
The result of these changes is an overwhelming increase in the number and type of images in existence. So how are we to deal with this reality? I was recently in Chicago for the first time. While there, I visited Millennium Park. A main feature of Millennium Park is Cloudgate. Cloudgate is a public sculpture by artist Anish Kapoor. It is a fascinating object, a giant stainless bean with a mirror polish, effectively a funhouse mirror on steroids. What fascinated me most wasn't the sculpture, as intriguing as it may be, but the way people interacted with it. Cloudgate is a giant, shiny camera magnet. Scarcely did I see a human get within 10 feet of it without shrouding their face with the viewfinder. It reminded me of this quote from Susan Sontag's On Photography. Quote, it would not be wrong to speak of people having a compulsion to photograph, to turn experience itself into a way of seeing. Ultimately, having an experience becomes identical with taking a photograph of it, and participating in a public event comes more and more to be equivalent to looking at it in photograph form. End quote. This desire to validate, or as Sontag suggests, to replace experience with images of experience, or to experience via the proxy of the camera is at the center of our contemporary situation. It seems as we continue to photograph more and more, less and less seems original, interesting, or thoughtful. My encounter with the cloud gate reminded me of my first photographic project, one using appropriated photographs. This work was titled, I Photograph, Therefore I Am. The title is an adaptation of the famous words of philosopher René Descartes, I think, therefore I am. I made this work first as a large print in grid form. My major professor's response at the time was that he, quote, had an allergic reaction to it. I think this was due in part, at least, to, look, to it looking like a bad advertisement for a camera manufacturer. As I was also enrolled in a bookmaking course at the time, I opted instead to put it in book form. This book is an ongoing collection of images depicting just what I saw so prominently before the cloud gate, people photographing themselves. I Photograph Therefore I Am is an, investiga an investigation into the new bionic man, half human, half camera. If this lecture were live, I would attempt to embarrass each of you by forcing you to admit that in fact, you have photographed yourselves in a mirror on at least one occasion. Sadly, I am guilty of this as well. It seems to me to be an obligatory act. Each of these images are sourced from Flickr. I collected them by simply performing a search query searching plus sign mirror space plus sign self-portrait. From there the curatorial process was simple. I deliberately chose images where the camera obstructs our, our vision of the photographer. This is done as a means of alluding to this bionic being. I know that these people are not consciously validating their existence by making a photograph of themselves, as the title and, and the Descartes reference suggests. I would argue, however, that in some way that's exactly what they are doing. This ultimately points to another issue related to truth and photography. That's something we'll discuss later. In spite of the constant flux of photographic reproduction and the increased speed and frequency with which we photograph, Technology seems to have had a minimal effect on the potential quality of photographic reproduction. If you're not willing to grant that claim, I think we can at least agree that we are at a point of diminishing return. For example, the daguerreotype is among the sharpest reproductive processes there is, and it is also among the first. Digital capture still struggles to rival large format film applications, and when it does, it's only in certain aspects. To summarize, here are my three overriding claims. First, photographic reproduction will constantly evolve with new technology. Second, this evolution has and will continue to increase the quantity of and dissemination of photographs. Finally, the reproductive accuracy of photographic reproduction will reach its limit if it hasn't already. What we can draw from those claims is that photographic reproduction cannot be improved further by changes in technology. However, both good and f bad photography can be made more frequent and will continue to exist in changing contexts and formats. 
The purpose of this first point is to support my belief that the authorship of meaningful images is in the recognition of meaning within the image, not in the image's creation. First, the subject of photographic reproduction exists outside of the agency of the author and sub subsequently is never entirely authored by the photographer. Ultimately, it would be foolish to say that one ought to be the creator of an object in order to classify photography as an artistic or meaningful act. The qualities of the image are, with few exceptions, out of the photographer's control. They are not a direct result of the photographer's vol volition. We do not create what we photographed. We dictate how or if it is photographed. And, as importantly, what to do with it afterwards. Every church in Fayette County is a photographic installation that I created as my MFA thesis exhibition. This series of nearly 300 images is, as suggested by the title, Every Church Within the Boundaries of Fayette County, Kentucky. Fayette County is the county within which the University of Kentucky is located. Each church was documented as it existed on the day I happened to encounter it. I spent approximately eight months shooting this body of work basically driving around with a map full of pushpins in the front seat of my car. Some days I might photograph 10 to 15 churches, some I may only get to one or two. Each of the prints was then printed as a 10 inch square and labeled with the GPS coordinates of the church as it existed on Google Earth at the bottom. The prints were then mounted on our archival foam core, hung in a tight grid, and attached to the gallery wall such that they might be easily remo removed by the viewer. This exhibition included a hand-painted map of Fayette County with white map pins marking the location of each church within the county. At the closing reception, bread and wine were served, and each visitor was handed an offering envelope upon arrival. They were given the option to remove a print and take it with them in exchange for a tithe or offering. Fayette County is able to support over one church per square mile, one church per 800 residents. However, it struggles to keep a handful of art galleries and art centers open. This exhibition, among other things, was a suggestion that the art world system for exchange needs to be reconsidered, or that perhaps there is a relationship be between the two that they could learn from each other. Because we don't create what we photograph, or at least most of us do not, Photography is in some capacity an act of reference to that which already exists. As stated earlier, photographic reproductions are merely mechanical, chemical, or digital reinterpretations of that which lies before the lens, film, sensor, pinhole, or photosensitive paper, and therefore are reproduced as dictated by the system at hand and limited by nature's physical boundaries. In a sense, all photographs or at some level, appropriations. In light of this, the very act of photographic reproduction is akin to collection and recontextualization of existing data. As a creative act, photographic reproduction is more like curation than creation. The authorial or creative act within the photographic process is one of pointing. It deals with inclusion and omission, with selection, the task at hand is determining what to place in and out of the frame. As photographers, we ought to have the ability to intuit how the system of the camera works, and specifically, how its inherent technology will interpret what lies before it. It seems to me that making technically well-crafted photographs as an end in itself is futile. Our ability to objectively reproduce reality is merely an issue of choosing the appropriate tools and not interfering with the reproductive system at play. Technical skill within photography is more related to one's ability to hide within the process than to impose our creative will. If only as photographers, we can stay out of the way. This desire to hide behind the objectivity of the reproductive process is a reoccurring theme within my practice as a photographer. A decision best articulated by the, this ongoing body of work titled Residential Facades. This series, like much of my work, makes a deliberate reference to images that are in the collective consciousness of artists, art historians, and lovers of art. 
Specifically, this project adopts the frontal and banal reproductive qualities of Baron and Hillebecker's typologies and uses them to leverage a comparison between the utilitarian structures of the Becker's industrial facades to the seemingly thoughtless design of suburban architecture. Residential Facades focuses on the documentation of suburbia, overgrown and underplanned. These continuously replicated structures boast an overwhelming sense of the generic, the nature of which is an indicator of the death of the local, the result of which is the eventual decline of spatially derived identity and the emergence of a generic suburban, or dare I say American, vernacular. These unadorned facades act as a veil of wealth and stability. They hint at the American dream, which in light of America's current national fiscal status, it seems we can no longer afford. The title itself confronts us with a convenient double entendre, one simultaneously describing the physical face of these homes, and in turn our neighborhoods and projected identities, and the illusion behind which lingers the fragility of a nation. Here is an installation view of this body of work. Residential facades is created in volumes, each of nine prints. They are displayed in a three by three grid and printed at nine inches by nine inches. These prints are designed specifically, and I think rather appropriately, to fit in white IKEA RIBA frames. If this objectivity is the case, as I have argued that it is, then meaning within photographic reproduction is also in the thing photographed. For example, one could argue that the lighting of Weston's pepper is of importance. It seems that all of the meaning and splendor of Weston's image exists in the pepper itself. It is his recognition and ability to recreate it that is the artistic act. If photographic reproduction is this act of purity, then it seems obvious that the meaning is inherently attached to the object or objects photographed, and with skill they transfer to the print as does the object's likeness. In regard to this, I will share a personal anecdote related to another one of my bodies of work. In late 2009 and early 2010, I installed first a solo exhibition and then a two-person exhibition of my series 11 megachurches. One was at my alma mater, a small liberal arts college in central Kentucky, and the other at an art center in, in Louisville, Kentucky. The series is a group of 11 40-inch by 40-inch Google Maps screen captures of what are affectionately titled megachurches. A megachurch is simply a Protestant Christian church with over 2,000 weekly attendants. The largest of these has approximately 30,000 visitors a week. My 11 images are churches hand-selected from the 100 largest churches in the U.S. for reasons of particular visual and contextual relationships. Mind you, in exhibiting this work in the northern part of the Bible Belt, which is another name for a specific region of the American South, the artist statement is left de deliberately vague. And I find it appropriate to, to be deliberately neutral, as not to sway or disinterest the viewer with text. What is most interesting about this body of work is the objectivity of the satellite imagery and their relationship between truth and photography. I am merely placing a square around the church, documenting it as it existed at the time Google did. There are no tricks, no gimmicks. This work is objectively taken from God's eye view. What has surprised me the most is the way people react to this work when it is recontextualized from Google Maps to the gallery wall. What this work has taught me about people and how they form interpretations is what I think is an important lesson. Whether or not meaning is inherent, there isn't a single objective way that work will be perceived. People bring their own baggage, own beliefs, objectives, dogma, and cynicism to the work. The exhibition in Louisville with fellow photographer Joe Johnson and his large format deadpan photographs of megachurch interiors received a fair amount of local press, considering that art press is limited in Kentucky. 
a full page spread in the local paper, and a few pages in the local monthly arts magazine. Reportedly, this exhibition offended a pastor of a nearby megachurch, whose church was documented in both bodies of work. I'm not even certain that he attended this exhibition. This Southeast Christian Church is the aforementioned church. Now, let me note that I cannot verify that offense was taken. I merely heard it secondhand. Though, if this is in fact the case, I would understand. Structurally, Southeast Christian Church looks like a gigantic circus tent, which is a truly unfortunate coincidence. Even if this instance is false, I have, it, I have had first-hand experience of viewers coming to completely divergent conclusions about the same body of work. Some view the work with anger as, as a result of land use, environmental, or tax-related issues. It's worth noting that American churches, large or small, do not pay property tax. And some, citing feelings of reverence and awe and appreciation, for God, his structures, and his followers. What these images depict is the nature of these institutions as well as their intimate relationships with the highway system, with parking lots, some with design motifs such as this one, and their necessary runoff ponds, the repetitious athletic fields, lush green lawns, fountains and waterfalls, cul-de-sacs, swimming pools, and generic suburban, exurban housing developments. In 2010, I self-published the book version of 11 megachurches. It's a limited edition of 1,000, digitally offset printed by an online printing company. These images of the book are courtesy of Self-Published Be Happy, a London-based organization founded by Bruno Schegel in 2010, with the aim of celebrating, studying, and promoting self-published photo books. Regardless of the bias we bring to interpretation, I believe that the act of photographic reproduction seems not to instill meaning, but freezes it, allowing said meaning to be extracted by the active viewer, who, as a result of the image's dissemination, has come across it. What the, meaning, what the medium offers, then, is a format, a portable rectangle, if you will, inside of which the photographer can neatly or hastily pack meaning, ideas, concepts, stories, questions, or emotions. This portable rectangle is then, in a truly democratic fashion, packaged for consumption by the masses, or, as it is often the case within the art world, can be selectively reproduced in a tidy, high-value, low-number, limited edition. Or, even less frequently, in an attempt to rival real art, can be made as a singular artistic original. What matters, though, is that the photograph is merely a vessel a ghost of reality, of meaning, not the real thing. Susan Sontag stated, quote, the knowledge gained through still photographs will always be some kind of sentimentalism, whether cynical or humanist. It will be a knowledge at bargain prices, a semblance of knowledge, a semblance of wisdom, as the act of taking pictures is a semblance of appropriation, a semblance of rape. If meaning within a photograph is recognized and not authored, then it seems appropriate that the authorship of meaningful images is in the recognition of that meaning, not in the creation of the imagery. It is not the act of reproduction that merit, merits valuation or praise, or even that dictates a good picture, but the decision at which point to reproduce and also at which point not to. Interestingly enough, it seems that all images are wrought with meaning, with irony, ideas, axioms, and cliches. Whether the photograph is or was or ever will be aware of them, is altogether another question. We photograph well because we see well. And if we are just wandering around with this portable rectangle, as I have called it, then what is stopping us from pointing it at existing images, trying then to take what we see and revive, recontextualize, or reconsider it? In an increasingly digital world, it only seems right to turn our cameras on the virtual, as we have been photographing the physical for hundreds of years. 34 Parking Lots is the first of many projects of mine that takes this charge. In 1967, Ed Ruscha published 34 Parking Lots. It is a very simple book, a cover, a title page, and 31, not 34, images, each with short captions, 
identifying the locations of 34 empty parking lots in the Los Angeles area. To create these images, one Sunday afternoon, Ruscha hired aerial photographer Art Alanis, and he also hired a helicopter. In, in one and a half hours, Ruscha prompted Alanis to photograph a selection of empty lots simply by Ruscha pointing at them. Those images make up this book. Ruscha once stated, I believe referring to his book 26 Gasoline Stations, that if the images he wanted were in existence, he would have just used them. However, because they were not, he had to make them himself. I think this is applicable to, to any of his photographic works. In 2008, while closely studying Rocher's book at the University of Kentucky's Fine Arts Library, I started taking very specific notes and decided that though I was not in Los Angeles and did not have the money to hire an aerial photographer or a helicopter, I could recreate this work. I was interested in the access I had via my armchair, the fact that I, though being physically in Kentucky, could survey Los Angeles and scout the sites of Rocher's original and, and recreate this work. Visually, I opted to keep the images, images in color, and rather than produce a, a replica, as some have done, I would give the viewer a broader context. I chose an aspect ratio for the images that related to my Apple cinema display, deliberately making a reference to the internet. This notion of access via the internet has greatly informed the rest of my work. What resulted was a five inch, five and a half inch by eight and a half inch limited edition book that page for page replicates the 1967 original. This book is then sold for $24.46, which is the price of Rouchet's first book run through an inflation calculator. Simultaneous to my rendition of 34 parking lots was the project 41 Walmart Supercenters. In copying Rouchet, I started to consider how else I might use this archive. Literally, I had every inch of the surface of the earth at my fingertips. My first decision was to consider what I might relate to as the current iconic American symbol, as the gasoline and the automobile had been for Ruche in the 60s. My first intuition was the big, big box retailer, Walmart. The result was 41 Walmart supercenters, the number 41 stemming from the av average number of supercenters per state in the U.S. This project manifested itself as a 10 inch by 10 inch print portfolio, initially completed in early 2009, though it is currently under revision. Each image was 8 inches by 8 inches with a 1 inch black border, and was made using a digital negative created from Google Maps. That negative was then hand printed in the darkroom onto a matte finish fiber based silver gelatin paper. The resulting prints mimic the 8 inch roll film format known to aerial film photographers. I made this work in sort of a bubble, knowing that I was doing something thoughtful and that I didn't see many around me doing it. That is, until I received an email from artist and thief Joachim Schmidt. Mind you that I call him a thief in reverence, with the utmost respect. It's a term of endearment, so far as I am concerned. Joachim is the founder of ABC, the Artist Book Cooperative. ABC is a, a group of international artists using print-on-demand publishing, but more importantly for me, it is a group of fellow artists, many of whom are, are attempting to push the limits, limits of reuse of vernacular imagery. In 2011, the, Ar the Arles Photo Festival festival was headlined by an exhibition titled From Here On, featuring 36 artists, including a few ABC members. The curators, including Joachim, penned this manifesto. Now, we're a species of editors. We all recycle, clip, and cut, remix, and upload. We can make images do anything. All we need is an eye, a brain, a camera, a phone, a laptop, a scanner, a point of view. And when we're not editing, we're making. We're making more than ever, because our resources are limitless and the possibilities endless. We have an internet full of inspiration, the profound, the beautiful, the disturbing, the ridiculous, the trivial, the vernacular, and the intimate. We have next to nothing cameras that record the lightest light, the darkest dark. This techn technological potential has creative consequences. 
It changes our sense of what it means to make it. It results in work that feels like play, work that turns old into new, that elevates the banal, work that has a past but feels absolutely present. We want to give this work a new status. Things will be different from here on. This is their suggestion to the problem at hand. A crucial factor of this idea is that one's work is of no value if not seen. As a result, we must also consider the appropriate means and met methods for dissemination and be cognizant of the context into which our work is placed, as they, as much as the work itself, will dictate interpretation. Susan Sontag also stated that, quote, that most logical of 19th century aesthetes, Mallarmé, said that everything in the world exists in order to end in a book. Today, everything exists to end in a photograph, end quote. Perhaps, as with everything else in our contemporary situation, now everything exists to be deposited online. And as Fred Ritkin put it in his book After Photography, digital images are, quote, discrete and malleable records of the visible that can and will be linked, transmitted, recontextualized, and fabricated, end quote. As an artist and an educator, I have gotten the privilege of living in such art world hotspots as Kentucky and Kansas. If you are not familiar with American geography, let me officially announce that I am being utterly sarcastic. If I were a basketball coach, however, this would be an entirely different story. Though I am mostly joking, and I'm certainly not ungrateful to be employed, there is a significance to my lack of proximity to what one might call an art world center. This distance, this barrier of space has greatly dictated the way I approach my work. It must be portable, cheap, and malleable, and easily accessible to many via the web. It is as a solution to this outsider situation, coupled with an interest in the conceptual art of the 60s and 70s, namely the books of Ruscha and Baldessari, that I stumbled into self-publishing and print-on-demand, which in turn led me to ABC. As a result of this engagement with web-based print-on-demand and online printing companies, it seemed appropriate that the source of my work also shift increasingly toward a more universal and web-accessible place. These include social media sites, Google Maps, Wikipedia, Flickr, etc. I will briefly introduce you to a few other works. Sorority Skin Tones, a Pantone color guide is a seven inch square print on demand artist book that contains 20 Pantone color swatches created by color averaging screen captures isolating the necks, chests, legs, arms, etc. from photographs hosted on the 10 largest American sororities official Facebook pages. The colors were chosen by selecting small sections of skin, color averaging them, and then matching them to the nearest Pantone equivalent. Then, these Pantone color numbers were placed in a spreadsheet and organized to obtain what are objectively, I might add, the 20 most prominent shades of sorority skin. Here are the resulting 20 skin tones. Real Estate Opportunities, a 2010 International Investment Guide, is another print-on-demand book. This book lists the 20 nations with the highest debt per capita, according to Wikipedia. The book combines artist-generated maps and data sourced directly from wikipedia.com. This book is another play on an earlier book by, Ru by Ruscha of the same title. Whereas Ruscha's book depicts empty lots for sale in Los Angeles, which may actually have been a good investment, this book acts as a nudge for investors, asking them to consider diversifying their investment portfolio on a global scale, and contains the nations who may be in most need of or receptive to international support. NYSE colon CBL Mall Maps is a print-on-demand artist book as well. It contains the floor maps of all 87 regional malls owned by the Real Estate Investment Trust, CBL, and Associates and Properties. The book combines these maps with text from CBL's investor website. The text is as follows. CBL and Associates Properties, Inc. is a real estate investment trust listed on the New York Stock Exchange under the symbol CBL. CBL is one of the largest REITs in the United States and owns, holds interest in, 
or manages 159 properties, including 88 market-dominant enclosed malls and open-air centers from coast to coast. CBL is an active developer of new regional malls, open-air centers, lifestyle, and community centers. The company's growth strategy also comes from the acquisition of regional malls. Since going public in 1993, CBL has generated tremendous growth as a company, measured both by portfolio size and increases in ca cash flows and dividends. The company looks forward to continuing success through expansion, renovation, and aggressive leasing at its properties, in addition to its ongoing development and acquisition business. CBL also seeks opportunities to increase income through sponsorship, branding, and other initiatives. In closing, let me urge you to consider that this model of authorship is serious. I would not recommend that we all stop making pictures. This would be absurd. But it does seem, to me at least, that we should consider where authorship lies and how we might redefine the act of photography and our methods for sending it out to be seen, to be understood, and to be potentially recycled. Thank you. For more information or to view more of my work, please visit www.travisschafer.com.